In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. We've all heard that a lot of times. And it has <clears throat> slipped into uh, common English usage to refer to that, not quite exactly in those words, but with the, oh, but we all have our cross to bear, which is true. But we often trivialize it, as in, it's late, I'm tired, it's cold and raining, and I still have to take the trash out. Oh, we all have our cross to bear. But what really struck me, just two days ago, we went... Um, Michelle and I went to the opera, and the opera is Silent Night. There's going to be one more uh, production of it this afternoon. It was wonderful. It's also very poignant. The opera is about uh, the uh, Christmas truce that spontaneously happened in 1914, at the beginning of World War, the early months of World War I. And some of you who were here Christmas Eve, you know I preached about that. Um, I'm not going to repeat that. But there's a point in the opera that was really poignant to me, especially thinking about this text, because <clears throat> on Christmas Day, they decided that they would continue the truce long enough to gather up all the dead of the various sides of the war so that they could have a decent burial. And they brought them all out and laid them out in a line, all mixed together, Germans and French and Scots. And the Roman priest of the Scottish, um, of the Scottish army came and gave last rites to all of them, and they came out and placed a cross on each one. And it was very poignant first to see that in death, the, the, um, the idea of, well, he's a German or he's a Frenchman or he's a Scot went away. They were all men. They were all people. They'd all been loved by somebody, and they were equal, equally loved, equally mourned in death. I got to thinking, what was the cross to bear? You know, what, what were the soldiers? What, was, what were they bearing as they did this? And it, again, occurred to me that what they were bearing at that point was sorrow. That up until that point, the enemy were not human. They were not people, and they were shooting them like dogs. And now they had discovered overnight that they were just like them. And they were real people, and they'd been murdering each other. Subtitle on the opera said that when your enemy becomes human, war is no longer possible. That's what happened. And they were bearing that immense weight of what they had done to each other with the obvious need for repentance that came with it. I don't want to give it away in case you ever get a chance to see it, but one of the things that is clear is that that uh, just like in all the jokes and everything, that when you finally turn and do the right thing, somebody's going to punish you for it. And that's what happened in, in the opera, too. All the people who decided they were going to quit shooting each other were all punished for not doing the right thing for their king and country. When Jesus was talking to his disciples in the gospel we heard today, he had just had the immediate preceding part of the gospel was Jesus turning to the disciples and saying, Who do you say that I am? And it was Peter who said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus, we pick up right there with Jesus beginning to teach them what it meant to be the Messiah. Not that he would become the king of Israel and have great armies and power and wealth, but that he would be arrested and punished and tortured and killed. And, of course, on the third day, rise again. But that went right over their heads. 
And Peter, who had just gotten it right, got it wrong. Pulling Jesus aside, Mark doesn't tell us what he said, simply that he rebuked Jesus for doing that. You can imagine. How can you say such a thing? Why? You're supposed to be the Messiah. You're supposed to do it to them. They're not supposed to do it to you. I can imagine all of this. And Jesus turns and rebukes Peter as strongly as anyone has ever rebuked. Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking of human things, not divine things. It's always the way it is. We get off track when we start thinking of power and influence and wealth and comfort and all those other things that aren't bad in themselves except when they replace God. And then they are. Putting God first is not easy. Which is why we should never really trivialize our thought of having a cross to bear because it means it's not it means that life will actually be difficult at times if we are serious about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because those who do have wealth, power, comfort, and all those other things are not going to like it when we start putting God first. And especially when we start treating other people as human beings rather than something else. We hear it all the time. And it's abundantly clear that the militants in ISIS or ISIL or whatever you want to call it don't see us as equivalent human beings and it's very easy to kill us if we get in their way. But look how easy it's becoming for us to do the same thing. Well, they're just terrorists. They're not people. They're awful. They're, they've, they're, they should be eliminated from the earth. You, you hear it. That's not what Jesus taught. What did Jesus teach? He said, you've heard it said you should love your friends and hate your enemies, but I say love your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you. It's a lot harder. And yet, it was his example in life. It's our call to live that life. Lent is a time to remind us, as we practice self-denial and reflection and discipline, that it's, we can easily slide out of being true disciples and start thinking of other things that are not nearly as important as God and God's Son and yet they overtake our lives. They push all those other things out of the way. Repentance, by the way, doesn't mean feeling sorry, although frequently when we realize that we have strayed, we do feel sorry. The word repentance means to turn around, to change your mind, to take a different direction. And that's the real challenge. It's one thing to feel bad about what we might have done or not done or whatever. It's another thing to actually change our behavior and start living differently. But that's the challenge. No one really likes to hear that. I know I don't like to preach it. But it's what we're called to do. Now there is the one piece of good news we should never forget at the end. That those who lose their life for Jesus' sake will actually gain it. That by putting God first, by following Jesus first, while our lives may not always be as pleasant and comfortable as we would like, as Jesus said, we are laying up for ourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not consume. It is in laying up that treasure that we lay up our everlasting life that God has promised to us and Jesus has won for us on the cross. That's a good thing just to keep in mind. It always seems so far off, so far off unless, of course, we're sick or the car is sliding off the road in the snow, and then maybe it gets a little closer. But if we can remember that, even when the going is tough, then we can remember why we're following Jesus Christ. Amen.